Hi, I'm Rhonda Pick, Managing Editor of Pick Health Today. Joining me is Dr. Phil Gogger. He is an Associate Professor at Iowa State University. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. We are talking about an ongoing topic with you, um, Swine Influenza A, and we'd like to just kind of get an update from you about, let's start with why, why does this continue to be a challenge? Okay. Uh, no, Influenza A virus does continue to be one of the primary respiratory path pathogens that challenge our swine production systems in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, one of the primary reasons that influenza continues to be a respiratory problem is its ubiquitous nature that um, that's, is consistent with the virus as far as finding it pretty much anywhere throughout the U.S. and again throughout the world. It's a highly transmissible virus, so it's transmitted from pig to pig fairly easily. And then also some of our production practices, such as the movement of pigs over long distances, have um, contributed to that issue of it being such a problem within uh, swine uh, production systems as well. But probably one of the biggest uh, factors that's continued to make it such an issue is the genetic diversity that ultimately leads to issues with developing effective vaccines that can control the virus. So with that in mind and um, the virus's uh, own unique genetic nature, it's a segmented virus, so it can undergo a process called reassortment. That adds to genetic changes besides the fact it's an RNA virus and you get these small changes in the genome that can add to that diversity too. So it's one of the pathogens that's monitored fairly closely. And with a USDA program in place that we have two, we submit uh, sequences and viruses to that. So there's an actual national surveillance program in place. What we've noticed is that there's an interplay between human and swine influenza viruses. And I think it gets overlooked that oftentimes there are human influenza viruses that spill over into pigs. Mm -hmm. They're sporadically detected, but then occasionally one of those will have some type of fitness enough that it can establish itself within the swine population and then it becomes adapted to swine with time, but it becomes a new uh, genetic clade, we call it, which is another level of that genetic diversity circulating in swine. In your talk at the American Association of Swine Veterinarians annual meeting, mm -hmm. um, one of the points you hit home is the importance of asking the right question mm -hmm. when you're doing diagnostics and testing. Correct. Talk about where, where things can go off the grid a little bit. Asking the right diagnostic question becomes important in how you want to approach um, either diagnosing clinical disease with influenza or whether you are strictly wanting to monitor the virus within a swine production system. We have molecular diagnostic tests in place that will actually detect the presence of the virus, but we also have serology tests that uh, detect antibodies presence and asking the right question is important for those particular tests as well. So again, we kind of go back to the same theme of this genetic diversity within the virus itself. And it's probably had the greatest impact on antibody testing for flu. So uh, what I mean by that is um, it's kind of narrowed the scope of the use of the tests, unless you basically are uh, understanding uh, what the history is of the pigs regarding their exposure to influenza or whether they've been vaccinated what is the age of the pig that you're going to be testing to look for antibody? And then what's available at the diagnostic lab for that testing? There is a general test called an ELISA that will be able to detect antibody to pretty much any strain of flu, but it's just going to tell you whether the pig has been exposed, vaccinated, or perhaps a maternal antibody, we call it. So there could be passive transfer from the mothers or the, the dams to the piglets as well. And then there's a test called hemagglutination inhibition, which is used both in, on the swine side and the human side. That actually gives an indication of function of the antibody, whether or not that antibody could protect against influenza. But when you do perform that test, you have to make sure that you're using the correct test virus in order to accurately detect whether or not that pig would have antibodies to a particular strain. So it can really give you the uh, impression that you have a false negative sample for antibody if you're not careful in which viruses you're using for that particular test. And so again, it comes full circle back to asking the, the correct question. You know, when, do you want to uh, be able to test the pigs to see if they have antibody 
uh, two particular vaccine viruses, mm -hmm. which would give you an indication of that vaccine would work uh, for the influenza circulating within the farm. Yep. Um, and it could also ask the question, um, if you know of a new influenza that has been uh, recently detected and that's gaining some ground within the swine population becoming popular, you might ask the question, well, is, does my current vaccine, is it going to protect against this new strain if the pigs get exposed to it? So it really takes the right combination of the pig serum and what history is involved there from a vaccination exposure status perspective and also what virus you're going to use to test against it so you can accurately detect whether antibodies are there or not. On the molecular diagnostic side, being able to de actually detect the presence of the pathogen, um, not a lot has changed there per se and we have very good test uh, techniques in place to be able to detect these strains. Um, I think it gets confusing for some practitioners when we hit them with all of this talk about genetic diversity and all of the sequencing that is done. So we go from testing the, the sample that comes from a pig to know whether or not flu is present. And then we test for a particular subtype since we can have different subtypes within the pigs, which are primarily H1s or H3 viruses. And then we typically need to go to sequencing because you need to go that far to that level of looking at the virus if you're going to understand what phylogenetic clade that it's in, because that information is gonna then be used to, to tell whether or not a particular vaccine is gonna be useful within the farm. What about in the area of, of sampling and you know what are current techniques that are being used and where maybe some opportunities for improvement in sampling? And one area that gets overlooked is the endemic infections that occur in little baby pigs while they're still with their mothers. And so those endemic infections often go overlooked. The piglets might not be very clinical, but they are infected with influenza viruses and can carry those into the nursery. So one of the more uh, innovative sample types would be an udder wipe. And this is where you take a gauze pad, you wipe that along the udder, the skin of the, the mother pig. And obviously that's where the little pigs are nursing and all those nasal secretions can build up. And that udder wipe then can be soaked into some type of uh, culture media and then that can be tested for uh, influenza virus as a population type sample, but it gives a very good picture of uh, what types of influenza are circulating already at that age. In the nursery phase, um, utilizing nasal wipes where you don't have to necessarily take a nasal swab, that's a little bit more labor intensive. You can wipe a gauze just across the front nose of the pig, and those nasal secretions are picked up and they're good for detecting flu as well. If you look at how people are using diagnostics, what stands out to you as the most common misperception or place where, you know, lost opportunity? Well, I think one of the misconceptions is the fact that if you detect um, a particular subtype, either H1 or H3, that you can still stop at that point and you don't need to do any other additional uh, genetic characterization of the virus. So they assume that still to a certain degree, all H1 viruses are the same, or all H3 viruses circulating in pigs are the same. Of course, now that's not true. So a missed opportunity is really taking the time to go ahead and sequence those viruses and to work either with your diagnostic lab and some production systems have individuals that are skilled in doing some, what we call phylogenetic analysis. So they follow the evolution of the virus on their own and it, and it doesn't have to be that complicated um, there's programs available for doing that. Um, you can easily get the sequence from the diagnostic lab report, put that into the program with previous sequences. That's kind of a historical picture of the flu exposure in the herd. And then they can monitor whether that virus is uh, slowly changing over time, but straying so far away that maybe a vaccine virus would no longer work they've been using on the farm. And also, um, since flu is so ubiquitous, like um, we talked about earlier, there's always a chance you have a new strain, something completely different that has come onto the farm. And that can happen within a subtype as well. So it doesn't have to be new to be a different subtype. Within a subtype, it can be one of these different phylogenetic clades than what you had before. And that would be something that's necessary to know. When you're evaluating diagnostic results, what are related things that you're looking at that impact how you interpret those data? Okay, well, um, 
with the, the PCR technology we have, it's called real-time PCR. We report whether it's positive or negative, but you get a cycle threshold time. Mm -hmm. And that's a number that um, basically has an inverse correlation with the amount of virus that's in the sample. And at least for me, when I'm working with uh, different veterinarians who call into the diagnostic lab and have questions about their results, I'm looking at that CT value in order to first make a decision whether or not doing some subtyping or sequencing would be successful. Because we, with the sensitivity of a PCR, which is so high, we can detect very small quantities of virus in a sample. It means it's truly present, but we may struggle to do some further genetic characterization with that particular sample. So it would be prudent to go back to the farm and collect samples from maybe um, pigs that would be more acutely affected. So as you look at, you know, kind of a, a key take home message for producers and veterinarians that are continuing to deal with influenza A, what message do you have to share with them? I think probably the, the best message I can give is to have some conversations with the diagnostic lab and the individuals that are involved in doing the testing to help further or better understand what the different genetic clades mean when you're doing sequencing and monitoring these viruses. Because if you're gonna do the sequence and you don't understand the outcomes or what it means, then obviously you're not gonna be given the opportunity to make any sort of productive change within the herd itself with some um, <clears throat> evidence-based decisions, particularly regarding um, what vaccines you're gonna select and then also understanding a little bit better where the uh, infections could be either originating from mm -hmm. or perhaps persisting. And so you would wanna be able to control the exposure to those particular populations. We still have concern about incoming gilts that could be carrying new strains of flu. So it'd be important to be doing some diagnostic testing or monitoring there. Um, we still get feedback from veterinarians that trying to keep pace and understand all of the, the diversity associated with the virus and this rapid changing pace that it undergoes can be a real challenge. If you're gonna get it under control, you, you cannot get around the monitoring that needs to take place on a routine basis. So we used to, um, as practitioners, would just test pigs when something was coughing and clinically sick. Now, if you're gonna really make uh, good decisions on what you would do from a control standpoint, routine monitoring and sequencing would be one of the more important things you can do. Almost vital to do if you're going to make some changes in that regard.